Colombia está en la zona tropical, lo que significa que más o menos los rayos solares caen a una incidencia de 90 grados, o sea, el sol pasa justo por encima de nosotros. Una ventaja de estar en los trópicos es que hay un mayor potencial para el uso de la energía solar pues porque no hay invierno y no hay días muy corticos además la energía con la que llega la radiación solar aquí es mayor que en otras latitudes entonces uno pensaría que Colombia está aprovechando su potencial de energía solar lastimosamente no Pues nosotros aquí en Ciencia de Paso Merced fuimos y visitamos en Nuevo México, Estados Unidos, una planta de energía solar utilizando baterías donde se almacena la energía que viene del sol, solucionando el problema de los días nublados y las noches. Veamos qué nos dice uno de los ingenieros que diseñó esta planta de energía solar allá arriba en Albuquerque, Nuevo México. Veamos si lo So great, so I'm here with John Hawkins and we're talking about large scale solar. Okay, so what, what are we working with here? Okay, so this is about a half a megawatt of solar. So really, by today's utility scale standards, this is fairly small. So what we're doing here is we're taking about 500 kilowatt of solar. We're turning that into electricity here with the panels in the form of DC power, right? So it's like a battery. So to take that and then put it onto the grid, you have to turn that into AC power, right? So that's a uh, power that, that changes with time. And most of the grid is in AC power, right? So uh, most of your appliances and everything, we want to make sure that we can turn it into AC power so it can feed homes and businesses and things like that. Well, the one thing that that I, I need to impress upon everybody is the way the grid works. The power that you're using this second was made this second. So mm -hmm. we don't store it in things like, you know, tanks or pipes like gas or water or things like that. It's it's literally as soon as it's made, it is it is utilized. And it's important to realize that because if you produce too much, your voltage goes too high and all the things that all these manufacturers make have a certain voltage range. We don't want to go too high because we don't want to damage all that equipment. Part of the challenge with renewables is if you've got to make it the second that you're using it, well, the sun kind of goes away here and there depending on cloud cover and particularly at night. And then wind just kind of starts and stops based on mother nature. So our control center was saying, wow, this is really hard to control. They said, wow, it would be great if I could store this energy mm -hmm. and then be able to use it later. Mm -hmm. And so we said, let's do a project with some energy storage with some solar panels and see if we can kind of prove the science around won the grant and so we built this site yes. for a long time in the utility industry they're saying energy storage is kind of the holy grail for renewables right because mm -hmm. they're they're not predictable like something where you're you're boiling water and turning a turbine whether it's with nuclear or whether it's natural gas or coal or whatever the the medium was that we've done that with in the past mm -hmm. so it's not predictable and what they call that in the utility industry is it's not dispatchable mm -hmm. right so that means i can't start Start and stop a renewable whenever I want to. It's based on what's happening in, the, in, in nature at that time. So right now we're at 150. So why is that? Well, because we just had the sun go behind the clouds and uh, we could see this change even more as we hang out here. Like I said, keep in mind, whatever energy is being produced here is being used right now as mm -hmm. well. So we have to make sure that we can balance that out. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep it as predictable as, as possible. So why did we do energy storage to begin with? Mm -hmm. There's two issues that are challenges mm -hmm. for the utility industry, right? First, it's intermittency, which is the quick changes in time based on sun going behind the clouds, things like that. And then the other challenge is the best time for solar production is typically midday, right? Mm -hmm. So when do we have the highest load on our system? Well, at night, right? <laughs> typically, right? From here, it goes to that big green box over there. That green box over there is a transformer. So what it does is it takes this AC power at 600 volts, mm -hmm. or yeah, 600 volts, and it increases it to 12,470 volts. So which one of these is sort of the, the battery? Okay. Both of them are? I'll, uh, let's go uh, walk over that direction. Two, five, seven. Two, five, seven. One, two, three. So well, right now we have 500 kilowatts of battery storage for the fast intermittency. I know it is oversized, we've never used that, but when we built this, 
quite honestly, there was no rule of thumb. Right. right? So right. we were taking that science and, and uh, you know, the, the money that was intended for science and doing science, right? Mm -hmm. So we ended up learning quite a bit as we put this together. The other part of this is, so now I've got my PV, I've got my energy storage, so it's like a big bucket of electrons, so how do I control it? <laughs> so we built a control system, so. So if you look at the control system here, it's all the meters that we're doing to measure PV and battery storage and the output, just put together this algorithm that says, okay, what's going on on the, on, what's going on on the grid, what's going on in prices, what's going on with the solar resource, and we uh, basically wrote this program that makes the decision for us. What are some considerations that are specific to New Mexico, specific to this region? Um, so some of the big considerations now is cost, mm -hmm. right? So while PV and energy storage are both reducing in price by a lot, as compared to some of the cheaper kind of fossil fuel, particularly natural gas, mm -hmm. they're still either on par or maybe just getting to parity on that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we always had to consider as we were doing this is can our rate payer or our customers really pay for that, mm -hmm. right? So we wanted to make sure that we weren't trying to price people out mm -hmm. of being able to, to use electricity. It's almost the staple of a modern society these right. days. We always were really cognizant of understanding how much we could do while still ensuring that we made sure our rates were affordable. I had a question, like in the tropics in Colombia, what would be better, to have like these solar fields or each house independent, like each house with these solar panels on, on the roof? What would be more efficient? Uh, ooh, <laughs> it's hard to say. You get a lot of disagreement in the industry, okay. right? So as an example, uh, California recently passed a law that says every new house must have solar panels. Mm -hmm. Right? So that becomes really interesting from a utility perspective because when we design our distribution system, we add in a factor called a diversity factor. And what the diversity factor is basically says, I am taking a chance, I'm statistically taking a chance that I'm not going to be drying my hair with a one kilowatt blow dryer at the same time my next door neighbor, maybe you, is drying their hair, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't size that for the entire load that everybody's going to see a peak, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you reverse that out, now I've got generation, right? So everybody has generation on their house. And the question then becomes, okay, when they go off to work, everybody goes off to work, how much of that's coming back to the grid and how much do I have to size that grid bigger so that way I can ensure that it's safe to put all that power back on the grid when people are not home using it. So I've got to understand that both as I'm design designing that distribution system, right? So now, to go back to the question, is it more efficient? Well, it could be more efficient to have it all over the place, but as a utility, it makes it very, very difficult for me to understand, are they using power, are they producing power? So you have to have sensors and you have to have a bunch of stuff so that you can try to figure that out. This, I've got all the sensors I need, right? It's utility scale, I know what's going in, I know what's coming out. As you start to get more distributed, that puts a little bit more technology closer to the customer and further in, and probably you need more of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've done the economics on that, but there's a lot of different components to that question that make it a rather complex question. Okay, thanks. At least in my view. Okay, great, good. Food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for talking to us, John. No problem. Right. Happy to do it. cuando salga un video nuevo, suscríbete a nuestro canal oprimiendo el botón rojo y después la campanita.